My name is Urs Gasser. I'm the executive director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society here at Harvard University, one of the co-organizers of this conference. I've been joining you from afar today, and uh, it was a, a fascinating and, uh, a day. Uh, I learned a lot, and I, I must say I'm also uh, quite intrigued by, by the range of, of applications um, I've learned about today. I was fascinated by, for instance, the, the connected car uh, uh, narrative and story and the amount of data that is produced. So uh, certainly an eye-opening conference for me. Now, this panel uh, is uh, focusing on the role of government in the location-enabled society. Uh, we hope actually to close the loop um, with where we started uh, this morning, actually by fleshing out some of the issues that Greg Scott uh, identified in his presentation. Uh, we of course also hope that we can revisit and to a certain extent even synthesize uh, some of the other points that have been made uh, throughout the day uh, by the other panelists as far as the role of government uh, is concerned. Now, just to frame it a little bit and very briefly, um, I have heard three kind of core themes coming out of the conversation uh, this morning and, and in the afternoon. Um, one point is governments, it seems, um, can or should play at least three different functions uh, when it comes to um, creating, fostering, also managing a location-enabled society. The first function is uh, governments as an enabler. There was obviously a, a strong focus on the importance of creating an appropriate legal and policy framework that enables the collection and use of geolocation uh, data. In the same category, I would add, uh, it's also the role of governments as providers and users of location data, as well as the corresponding infrastructure, certainly something that came up uh, just in the previous panel before uh, the break. The second function, I think, that has emerged throughout the day is government as a constraining uh, force. For instance, looking at some safeguards or limitations that governments may put into place when it comes to the use or also collection of location data. The keywords, of course, are privacy first and foremost, but also consumer uh, protection. The third function uh, that has crystallized in the conversation is the government playing a leveling function, leveling the playing field uh, for both public and private actors. Uh, standards have come up several times, and I think when governments facilitate standard setting, that's certainly one way to level the playing field. Open data, an important point that Peter highlighted uh, uh, just before the break again, can also be seen as one of the instruments to create uh, as a more equal uh, landscape and avoid uh, some of the problems that we may face otherwise in these markets with high network effects. So in the first part of the panel, we hope to actually discuss in some greater detail these three functionalities by focusing on concrete examples from the public sector and not discuss these three functions in the abstract, but rather really zoom in on implementation issues and ask ourselves, well, if you roughly agree that these are the core functionalities that governments can play, how does that translate into practice? What does it mean at the conceptual layer? What does it mean uh, organizationally, but also uh, technologically, uh, and so forth? So this, this kind of the first um, part of the panel. The second uh, part of the panel will address another issue that has, uh, I think, been helpfully identified today, early in the morning even, and that is we not only have to think about the different roles that governments play and how to synchronize these functions, uh, but also about the interface between the public, the public sector and private actors, including uh, companies importantly, but also of course uh, users. And so in the second half of the panel, we hope to address this interface challenge, if you will, um, also by looking at the government behavior and government interventions from the side of the private sector. 
So with that rough framework in mind, uh, I just want to briefly introduce our panelists. You obviously have the bios in the materials. We'll start with uh, Steve Goldsmith, who's a professor of practice of government and the director of the Innovations in America Government Project at the Kennedy School here at Harvard. The second panelist will be Nigel Jacobs, the co-founder of the Office of New Urban Mechanics of the City of Boston, a fantastic initiative. I I'm looking forward to hear more. Ibele Okobi is the third panelist. She's the global head of Yahoo's Business and Human Rights Program. Um, she will broaden the scope again, addressing also some of the global challenges we face. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Sandy Pentland, um, director of MIT's Human Dynamics Lab, among many other things about most recent uh, insights from both uh, the NGO world, but also uh, from the corporate world. Now, each panelist promised me to stay within seven to ten minutes, and uh, that's a big promise. I'm Swiss, so I will enforce this time restriction <laughs> brutally, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, joking aside, I hope we'll have some time for discussion. Without further ado, uh, please, Steve, take the floor. Thank you. Thanks. Well, the, um when the number of panelists exceeds the audience, the amount of time should shrink, I think, probably, as a general rule. Um, so um, I, I bounce from being a hopelessly abstract as an academic to mired in how to pick up the trash as a former deputy mayor of New York and mayor of Indianapolis. So I will co I'll use my seven minutes appropriately, uh, mostly to tell stories, right? So um, I think the problem we've got and the opportunity we have deals mostly with uh, imagination, right? There are only so many Nigels in the world. And how the, the, the available information and the impact it can have on systems is so dramatic that we are restrained mostly by our imagination inside government. And the structures of government are almost antagonistic to what they need to be for us to move forward with the amount of information we have. And, and let me just do this really quickly. So um, several Decades ago, I was mayor of Indianapolis, long, long, long time in a distant past. And uh, Indianapolis at the time, because of, of grants, had a very sophisticated, this is 15 years ago, GIS system. And I got there and, and, and I met the guy who ran the system. And basically, every request to use GIS information had to go through him. He was the only guy that could understand all of the layers of complexity, right? So he was the gating agent to that information. The only way to get people to use the information was to move him to a different job, right? Because it forced people to use the information themselves. Because so long as everything went through a person who understood it and nobody else, there wasn't any, uh, any leveraging of the information. So now I'll go forward 10, 12 years. I'm deputy mayor of New York. New York has a very serious commitment to transparency and open data. Uh, they have a 311 system that is widely acclaimed, 20 million people a year called 311 system. And we say, OK, we have a transparent open, uh, open source system, a 311 system that's uh, relatively sophisticated. Uh, what's happening in terms of how we are leveraging solutions? And the answer is, well, not very much, right? Because uh, like many places, the uh, uh, open data effort is a uh, effort that says, okay, our data is up, now you figure out how to use it, right? Here it is. Um, and I'm not critical at all of New York because they were in, in advance in all of this, but my point is that we have, we have all of these pieces and the pieces weren't actually set up to uh, produce uh, solutions. So if you took the 311 data, and, and Nigel is kind of the world's leader in this, but if we, we took the 311 data, right, we created more uh, easily used GIS, uh, geographically located maps, so we knew, you know, everybody, and, and we'd visualize it so community boards could understand. If there was a big yellow mark, that meant a lot of people had complained about that intersection. And if you want to know whether the problem was solved, we should tell people whether the problem was solved. We wanted to know w whether it was a particular bar that got 25 noise complaints, so you ought to be able to figure out that bar. And, and, and the agencies now were worried, right, that there was so much visibility in the data that the number of complaints would go up from 20 million to 40 million. But but that's not actually what happened because people already knew how to complain, but because they couldn't see the information geographically
geographically sorted, they couldn't come up with solutions. So when we, t we hired somebody, took the data sets out to the community boards, taught them how to use the data sets, and lo and behold, what happens? They call in and go, you know why these people got hit on this intersection? Because your light's timed wrong. Why didn't you? We could just tell you that as soon as we see. And so the, what we began to do was unlock a, 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 a lot of information. So the principle here, basically, and this is kind of your three ideas of kind of how government should operate, is we, we, we have to go from becoming a complaint center to a platform for community engagement. And if you're a mayor of a city, everything's geographic. I mean, that's, that's what, there's nothing that isn't geographic. And the organizing of that geographical information unlocks these uh, people's imaginations and their solutions. Now, it, it, the government, as I started to say at the beginning, is antagonistic, not the government officials, but the structures of government, because people, right, somebody works in the transportation department, somebody works in the public works department, somebody works in the planning department, but people live in neighborhoods. They don't live in one of these departments, and the departments can't even see across the department. So now we have all this information, and the issue is how you set up a special office with, um, you know, a data analytics center or urban mechanics center or innovation leadership at the top that says we are now into the co-production of public <coughs> services and solutions. And we have all this geographic information and we put it together, we're going to unlock those answers. And, and you can go through this um, line by line and, and, and figure out how to solve these problems. Um, the, the, the last issue is that, that we have so badly restricted the discretion of public employees that they actually, we don't really trust them with this information. So even, even if they have these fancy tools that Nigel has, right, they don't really have decision support systems and full access to GIS systems. They just have kind of like many of the old forms. So, so I'm just suggesting that, in, in, uh, use this as an example, right? Why can't we give restaurant inspectors more discretion in New York City or Indianapolis or pick a city? Well, because we're not sure how they use their discretion. But that was like five years ago or ten years ago. Now we know exactly from their GIS um, mapping tools in their tablets how long they were in the restaurant, how many, how many uh, uh, infractions they wrote in that period of time or didn't, right? Where they went next, how, what the order of their work processes were, and the ability to, to ch and c cross that with other information we know about what's happening in that neighborhood with that restaurant or are their neighbors is dramatic. And so we can nominate, right? the outliers to the supervisors. So it's a, if you tie this all up together, I would suggest that the amount of information we've seen today on GIS systems and the platforms we have to do it will allow us to induce discretion in the public workforce, will allow them to work horizontally instead of vertically, and if they engage the public correctly, will allow them to uh, co-produce solutions in ways that have never been be done before. And if you have no idea what I said, Nigel will now tell you what it is. That was... Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> At a normal speed, though, it was 15 minutes, right? So. <laughs>